Well, to the core of our conversation today, we are talking about kidney disease, kidney health, and to be specific, kidney transplantation in this country. And I have a panel in studio with me to help me delve into it. But before we get to it, let's uh, familiarize ourselves. And now, kidney transplant refers to organ transplant of a kidney to a patient with chronic kidney disease, also called kidney failure. Now, when your kidney fails, it means they have stopped working well enough for you to survive without dialysis or a kidney transplant. Now, what are the causes of kidney failure? Remember, this is very layman. We have a doctor in studio who will break it down for us. In most cases, kidney failure is caused by other health problems that have done permanent damage or harm to your kidneys little by little over time. And some of those conditions could be diabetes, high blood pressure, autoimmune diseases such as lupus, genetic diseases like polycystic uh, kidney disease, nephrotic syndrome, urinary tract problems, and the doctor will be expounding more on the same and uh, some of the symptoms of a chronic kidney disease now you may notice one or more of the following symptoms if you if your kidneys are beginning to fail itching muscle cramps nausea and vomiting not feeling hungry swelling in your feet and ankles too much urine or not enough urine and trouble catching your breath trouble sleeping and that list could go on and on and uh, our panel in studio will be shedding light more on the same and speaking of which let's uh, look at a story of patrick kilons or mwalua who is known to many as a waterman of savo who gained admiration over his uh, passion for nature by supplying clean drinking water to wild animals at the Savo West National Park. Now, this was at a time when the country was reeling from a prolonged dry spell in 2016. Now, the 2018 head of state commendation recipient carries on with his work today, but not as effectively as he used to or as he would like to, owing to kidney failure, whose urgent treatment he is unable to afford. Bilotieno met with with Patrick as he watered the animals and also as he went in for dialysis. Inside Savo West National Park, a diverse group of animals roam and lie in their sun's unfiltered heat, waiting for the precious commodity to be served. Water. Patrick Malua, known to many as the waterman, is the designated waiter, serving the wildlife with the drink of life. They wait a few meters away as Maula fills the with water. He hit the headlines in 2017 when he voluntarily stepped in to rescue wild animals from the prolonged drought that hit the country in the previous year. I realized that the animals were dying out of that drought and there was nowhere they could get water because of the global warming. Uh, there was no rain for like three years and so it was very serious. So I decided when I came here I was so much touched to see the animals, they don't have water. So I decided to go back to Voi. I, I had a truck out of my money in the pocket, and then I brought water. The first day I brought water, I was so much shocked because many animals were coming, running for water. And uh, I felt a lot of joy. Over the last three years, he has been at it, driving 70 kilometers daily to feed the wild animals with water. However, the journey of nobility has become a difficult one, owing his deteriorating health. <laughs> the 45-year-old father of two has been ailing, and both of his kidneys have failed. He now has an extra trip twice a week to Moi Referral Hospital in Voi for dialysis. He loses three kilograms whenever he goes through the process, leaving him weak. Sometimes I could do three times a week, but uh, mostly I do it uh, you know, twice a week, and it's very tiresome because when you go for dialysis, you are on four hours on bed, around four and a half hours. Uh, then after that, you're so exhausted. Every time you get tired and tired and tired. So this has limited my work uh, for wildlife. Patrick now requires kidney transplant in India in less than 30 days. His brother has offered to donate one of his kidneys. This will cost four million shillings, which Patrick is currently unable to raise. Bill Otieno, NTV. Boy. 
Well, good news is that, and I believe this is a fact, that Patrick got the help he needs and he will be going to India to get the transplant that he has been hoping to have for a very long time now, which is good news. But many other patients out there who look forward to having transplants do not or do not have the capacity to do so and are living off dialysis, which is also a challenge in its own self. And as I said, I have a panel in studio to help us delve uh, further into that. Let me introduce them before we cross over to Moranga, Dr. Ahmed Sokwala. He is a nephrologist, which is a kidney doctor. And uh, Sheila Kitsura, who is a kidney transplant patient. Thank you for your time. And Joab Wako, founder Transplant Education Center and also kidney transplant patient. Thank you for making time. Now, before we walk into the world of kidney transplants, let's cross over to Moranga County. My colleague, Martin Moore is standing <coughs> by with a perspective from that county. Yes, yes, Gladys, thank you so much. It's uh, actually a cool Friday morning from Moranga County. Uh, as, you, as you can see, we are coming live from Moranga General Hospital, on the, actually at the dialysis section, which was uh, last month uh, nicknamed uh, Christine Wamboy Renal Dialysis Unit. Uh, this follows uh, the passing on of, of, a, of a young lady who was 18 years old and the family decided to, to donate uh, the dialysis machines, uh, one dialysis machine in her remembrance. And the county uh, took the, uh, the move very, very, very well and decided to rename this, uh, this, part, this section as Christine Wamboy in celebrating her life. Now, um, just to give you a, a small brief about uh, where I am currently at the dialysis uh, section. This dialysis section was uh, set up in uh, 2015, that is uh, three years, uh, sorry, four years ago. And uh, I'm being informed that it has had over 16,200 sessions since it was set up. Uh, this, uh, it has 10 machines and uh, it was uh, another one that was donated by, by the family now totaling to, to 11. Uh, what I can tell you is that this, thing, this, uh, this section has really, really, really uh, eased um, uh, dialysis uh, for the patients with their, with, with their kidney failures. This is because before it was set up, the, the, the patients used to leave uh, very early in the morning to, to Kenyatta, which was the only uh, hospital uh, that was offering dialysis. So uh, patients tell, uh, are telling me that they used to leave Murang at 4 just to be, to, 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 to be sure that they are at Kenyatta Hospital by 6 so that they can be able to queue. And uh, believe you me when they tell you that, they are telling me when they used to get to Kenyatta at 6, they will still find the line. And somebody, some of them would be attended even as, as late as even 10, 10 p.m. And mind you, somebody has left uh, the, the county at around 6. But they are saying since these machines came, it has eased uh, their, uh, their, their burden, uh, even in terms of cost, because... Uh, I remember when they were being set up, uh, when they were being launched, the county government uh, g gave an executive order that uh, the, the, the sessions, each and every session should be half of what was being charged at Kenyatta. Uh, I'm being told that they were charging, Kenyatta charges 10,000 10, shillings per session. But here, uh, the patients uh, only get, get the services, uh, the hemodialysis, for only 5,000 shillings, uh, which they say is uh, very friendly to them. And at least they can be able to get the two sessions that are required so that to, to, you know, to prolong their life. And uh, the amazing thing is these machines, I'm being told, they, they do not only uh, help or help save lives of the people of Moranga. They even, uh, people from the neighboring counties like Kirinyaga, Anyeri, and uh, Kiambu, some of them come here for dialysis. As, as I'm talking to you right now, uh, there, there, is, uh, there, there are 10 patients who are uh, ongoing, who are being receiving the services of the, of the dialysis. And uh, right outside here, I, I can see patient, uh, the patient's families patiently waiting for them to, to, do, to, to get the dialysis so that they can go home. And uh, I'll be talking to... One, one of the patients and uh, one of the patients and even the people in charge of this facility to tell me more about it. But it is, uh, it, it is a service that has really come to help the people of Moranga and not only Moranga, but even from the neighboring counties. In terms of, uh, uh, in terms of treatment, uh, they are saying it is pocket friendly and there are no long queues. Gladys, I'll be coming back to you later as I engage the patient and the people in charge of this uh, facility. Back to you, Gladys.
Thank you, Martin Moore, speaking to us from Moranga General Hospital. Some good news there that there is a dialysis machine. There is a section that has been revamped and it's going a long way in helping uh, kidney patients. Now, to you, Dr. Terry, I'll start with you, Dr. Ahmed. That is such good news considering that uh, the county itself said let's halve the cost to help people, more people be able to get the service in the county, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, um I think it's now two, two, two years uh, since the government put up dialysis units in all the counties mm -hmm. and that's an amazing thing they did. Uh, all the counties have dialysis units and if you have NHIF the dialysis is free of charge. Mm -hmm. So people who are suffering you know because the kidney has a crucial function mm -hmm. of getting out toxins, getting out water of the body and if you don't do that mm -hmm. then you end up dying. But all these patients now can get dialysis, adequate dialysis in these centers and can live for longer with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll get to you, sorry, Shirley, in a moment. Let me start with Job. From your experience, especially with the foundation, what have you seen? Have the counties come to alleviate the pressure that was seen on KNH? Yes, uh, since uh, NHF has taken over uh, dialysis, they started paying for dialysis. Mm -hmm. We've seen that a lot of people are able to afford or to access dialysis, whereas before you had to pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And that was very challenging for a lot of people because they could not afford or they'd have to sell off things, shambas, <coughs> those kind of things just to afford dialysis. Mm -hmm. But then when NHF stepped in, which mm -hmm. is we're very thankful for, yeah. they were able to access it. And also, as Dr. Sukwala has said, the government has taken that responsibility and they've opened a lot of dialysis centers. Mm -hmm. uh, I went for a conference in Mombasa where we were talking about how the government has has gone to different counties. They're, they're able to now, uh, more people are able to access it. Mm -hmm. They're able to go for dialysis that, where before they, they had to go far to uh, KNH or to Nakuru. There were some places where they had to, they couldn't access before. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot more dialysis centers that have opened up. Mm -hmm. We're very thankful for the government for that. Okay, Sheila, you're a recipient of uh, a transplant. But before that, of course, there was the dialysis that you had to go through. Tell me, how much was it per session? Okay, per session, that was, I used to spend 10,000. Mm -hmm. It depends with the hospital which I, I, I went. Okay, at times 15,000. Mm -hmm. Yes. And how long ago was this? That's now two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. And that was independent of an NHIF? No, no. Uh -huh. By then, NHIF had not but, come yeah, had in. No, that was 2015 there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But are we saying right now, if you do not have your NHIF, you could spend the same amount? Mm, okay, I can't tell now. <laughs> yeah, now that you're a recipient, <laughs> your life has changed. Dr. Eric can yes. probably answer that so, question. Yeah, if you don't have NHIF, you're going to spend around 10,000 uh, shillings per dialysis session. And you need at least two, at least two, but, uh, uh, you know, advisably three times a week dialysis. Because mm -hmm. your kidney works 24 hours, seven days a week. You're mm -hmm. trying to do that function in three times four hours. So that's mm -hmm. 30,000 a week. Mm -hmm. Okay, 30,000, that's if you two times four weeks, that's 120,000 mm -hmm. uh, per month. Mm -hmm. And that's such a huge cost, mm -hmm. okay? Let's say, you know, if you get a kidney transplant, all that cost is gone, you know, to almost half, because you still need medications. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. to, to, to We'll discuss more about transplants, yes. I guess, and yeah. we'll discuss that. Actually, that you've just <laughs> taken the words out of my mouth. Let's just uh, delve into it. And maybe as we go along, just unpark little by little. First of all, kidney diseases. There's acute kidney injury, also called acute renal failure, and chronic kidney disease, also called kidney failure. Please differentiate the two for us. Let's start from there. Right. This is very important. You know, yeah. I get patients coming into the clinic saying, oh, you know, one of my cousins had kidney failure and then... He was on dialysis for two weeks. Thereafter, he doesn't require dialysis. And why do I require dialysis for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. So that comes in this acute and chronic. Acute kidney injury uh, means that your kidneys go to sleep in layman's thumb. Okay? For example, you get infection, you go into the ICU, your blood pressure goes down, you, or you get malaria, any type of infection which causes your blood pressure to go down. Mm -hmm. Your kidneys go to sleep uh, in layman's thumb. You need support because the kidney as I said earlier, mm -hmm. has a lot of functions and mm -hmm. those functions need to be carried out by dialysis. Mm -hmm. Then once you know the infection gets better, the blood pressure gets better, the kidney starts waking up. Mm -hmm. Okay, The kidney works. That's acute kidney injury. Chronic kidney disease is when your kidneys have been ailing for a long time. Okay, And the most common cause is diabetes, which affects the kidney, which damages the kidney. Diabetes, hypertension, you listed them up yeah. very well there. Mm -hmm. And you know that you 
kidney, the different stages. Yeah. So, you know, stage one to stage five. So if you're caught in early stages, stage one, and you get appropriate treatment, mm -hmm. then you decrease the progression of, uh, of, of the kidney failure. Mm -hmm. So chronic kidney disease means both the kidneys have failed and there's nothing we can do. Do, di do dialysis mm -hmm. until you get a kidney transplant. Okay, now I understand that you can actually, as you said, reverse acute kidney. Yes. yes, as opposed to the chronic. And how do you do that? Dialysis will be enough or do you now have to do dialysis plus medication? So uh, dialysis plus medication. Mm -hmm. It all depends on what's causing your acute kidney injury. Mm -hmm. Okay, the underlying disease which makes your kidney to go to sleep. Okay, you treat that underlying disease oh, okay. and your kidneys gradually regenerate and mm -hmm. they start working again. Mm -hmm. So you can have acute kidney injury anytime, you know, it can take two weeks or six weeks for the kidneys uh, to start working. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Sheila, you are a recipient of a kidney transplant. It happened to two years ago, you said? Okay, it was in 2016. 2016. Yeah. Okay, so how did you find out or how did we get to kidney failure? Okay, okay, I, I started with uh, diabetes. I've been diabetic now for 22 years. So it started in an early age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, before that, I didn't know that the diabetes would cause these problems. Mm -hmm. And I think I was not so keen with my diabetic uh, situation by then. Yeah. And then it came to 2014. Mm -hmm. That's when I started having problems, seriously. When I started, started, started my medication with injections mm -hmm. on insulin. Mm -hmm. I used to fall down, pass, pass out <coughs> because of the injections, because I was not checking the injections well. Mm -hmm. Then it came to 2015. I started, my legs started swelling. I went to the doctors, but they could not find what was really happening. The whole of 2015, 20, uh, 20, late uh, 2015, that's the time, I went to the doctor and they found out that my kidneys had failed. That's both the of them? Yeah, both of them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when they knew had to go through dialysis now, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, for you, Job, the story is similar, but a little bit different. Yeah, yes. diagnosed in 2017, is it? No, 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension, because they say kidney disease is a silent disease. You have no symptoms from stage one to stage four. There's, there are actually five stages, mm -hmm. and the symptoms come in at stage five or four, Five, you know, so that's when you start feeling nauseate, nauseated or tired or those kind of things. But for me, I, I had nothing, no symptoms at all. I didn't even know I had hypertension until I was rushed to the ICU almost unconscious because all my electrolytes, because the kidney controls potassium and mm -hmm. uh, other electrolytes like phosphorus as well. Yeah. And so my, my blood pressure was so high I started getting headaches. And so I was wondering why am I getting headaches? what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm rushed to the hospital and that's where I'm told that uh, my kidneys have shut down. Uh, I had no idea then. I, I was shocked, you know, mm -hmm. to be told that. And that's how I found out that I have kidney disease. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, now Dr. Ari, I'll come to you. Sure. At what point, just listening to them, at what point do you now say this is a case of a kidney transplant? So, first of all, uh, acute kidney injury doesn't get a kidney transplant. Yeah. You have to have chronic kidney disease. You have to be, you know, uh, your kidney has to be gradually, you have to see that it's getting bad uh, gradually. Uh, you know, uh, for, for Sheila, she had diabetes. And we yeah. said number one cause of chronic kidney disease is diabetes. And what she had is type 1 diabetes, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which affected both kidneys. For Job, what I think she ha he had is glomerulonephritis. That means inflammation of the kidneys. The hypertension comes in as a secondary thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Because your kidneys also control blood pressure. If your kidneys don't work very well, your blood pressure is going to go up. Mm -hmm. So that's the cause. So you you know, so we have something called preemptive transplant. Mm -hmm. We can even do a kidney transplant before you start dialysis. You know, the blood works which we measure, mm -hmm. uh, what we call creatinine, it's one of the best products in the blood mm -hmm. which measures uh, how bad your kidneys are. Mm -hmm. If your kidneys are working very well, your creatinine is low. If your kidneys are bad, they gradually go up. Then there's a certain stage now, uh, you know that the kidneys are not working very well and you have what we call uremic symptoms like uh, Job said, mm -hmm. nausea, vomiting, feeling weak, tired, headache, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to do any work, your legs are swollen mm -hmm. and at that stage now you decide you need dialysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people do transplant before dialysis, mm -hmm. okay, or you can start dialysis as you prepare 
uh, for a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. Okay, for you, how long did it take, Sheila, to get on to the transplant? Okay, it just took nine months for, dial for dialysis only. Mm -hmm. yes. So you did dialysis and in the ninth month yes. you were able to get a yes. transplant. Yes. Okay, now it, that sounds like pretty fast considering yeah. the procedures in between. Yeah. You know, for example, getting a donor. Who donated for you? My husband donated. Interesting. Yes. Okay, now I'll come back to you, Dr. Ari, because I know doctors most likely would rather work with family members first before we get to the spouse. So when now do you say, okay, fine, let's work with the spouse if that's the last resort? So you mean uh, spouses and not family members? Well, <laughs> I see what you did there, but you know what I mean. So, you know, fortunately, and uh, my pleasure, I was Sheila's doctor. Mm. So, you know, we were looking for a donor for her. You know, she, uh, uh, family members, that's the most closest, because yeah. what happens, a kidney, when you get a kidney, it's a foreign body. And your body, you know, anything foreign in your body, your body tries to fight it, mm -hmm. what we call rejection. So the reason why you want close family members is because you're, you know, you're more closer to your brother or sister genetically so that your body doesn't fight that, you know, the new organ. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we want, you know, family members. So we start with siblings, parents, uh, and, and that's how we go. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, if you don't get anyone around that circle, then also, you know, emotionally related uh, we yeah. were, what we call emotionally related donors, mm -hmm. like spouses or very, very child, close childhood friends, mm -hmm. you know, which you have evidence of, yeah. uh, then we can accept them. Uh, so in Kenya, what we do only is living related kidney transplants, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. In the West, uh, you know, where I'm trained in Canada, we do a deceased donor, like, you know, you get an accident, you get brain dead, but your organs are still well, yeah. and then you get that organ. As long as there's a good match, yeah. okay, where we do a matching mm -hmm. means the genetically uh, genetical map of yourself and the one who's donating the kidney mm. it, it it's it's similar so that your body doesn't reject that new new kidney okay Sheila before you ended up with a husband giving you the kidney I'm assuming you try the family members as Dr. Tari is saying how was that okay we tried with my brothers my sister and uh, one of my brother was found he had a pressure he could not help high blood pressure high blood pressure mm -hmm. yeah and then my sister we matched but uh, it was unfortunate that year it was in december she passed away she had an accident and so after that now it was only my husband who was there okay she brings yeah. up a very interesting point mm -hmm. to Tari. she passed away she had a good kidney she mm -hmm. was ready to give it to her why couldn't you harvest that one and give it to her so you know logistics to, before even we go to logistics, we have to lo look at our health, you know, the law, the health yeah. bill doesn't still allow us to do disease donor transplants. In Kenya? In Kenya. So, and then the other thing is, you know, where did she pass away? The kidney they cannot stay out of the body for more than, you know, a couple of minutes. So we have to, if we have that uh, logistics available in this country, which hopefully we will get there mm -hmm. in the future, then you know you you identify she had an accident and she's already willing to get give the kidney mm -hmm. take her to the hospital harvest the kidney and you know immediately you call in Sheila to come to the hospital and you do the and transplant. it happens yes. okay sounds like what we're watching movies it happens really fast right. but gi give us a bit of a timeline if everything was aligned what what are we talking about how long should it should the organ stay out of a body or in the body when somebody is dead how does that work so what we have is warm ischemia time and cold ischemia time mm -hmm. okay so you know when the kidney is attached to the body it's receiving blood supply yes. and that's the nutrition for the kidney mm -hmm. when a person you know gets an accident and dies mm -hmm. there's no blood flow to the kidney yeah. and when there's no blood flow the cells die off mm -hmm. so what happens is you know the kidney is harvested within 30 minutes mm -hmm. okay but it's put in t into ice yeah. so that the function of those cells go down mm -hmm. so they don't need you know more oxygen they don't need more glucose to survive mm -hmm. so that's you can store it in that ice for a longer period of time even six hours to 12 hours mm -hmm. until you get a kidney uh, to the to the donor mm -hmm. but the longer the cold ischemia time or the longer the warm ischemia time yeah. the chances of the kidney not working okay all right job to you how long did it take before you could get a donor well it took me a year and a half mm -hmm. uh, before I could get my, my donor and my donor was my sister so starting those conversations of asking for a kidney yeah. is, is something very 
I, I don't want to say hard, it's, it's, it's challenging because how do you ask someone for an <coughs> organ, a kidney or a liver, whatever it is you need. So we had to start those conversations and lucky for me, my sister, she volunteered. She came and said, you know what? I'm really touched. Uh, we've grown up together. She's known me for that long. Mm. And so she says that she wants to donate to me. Mm -hmm. But not very many get many people get that yeah. chance or get that, you know, a person who's willing to say, hey, I want to donate to you. Mm -hmm. So after we did that, we had to go through the testing. And that is very rigorous in itself. And the fact that she was young, uh, I'm below 30, and she was below 30 as well at that time, mm -hmm. uh, the doctors were wondering about her being married, uh, the scars, you know, the, the other things that come into play when you're a young person, a young donor, mm -hmm. you see. So it took a, a, a year and a half for me to get that transplant. Mm -hmm. yes. And you're both in good health. Yes, so both in <laughs> very good health. Thank you. Okay, now let's go back to the conversation about donors. He talked about the age factor. Doctors talk about being young medically, yeah, and 18 and above you can donate, but they'd rather 22 and above. Is that the case? That's yeah, that's 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 the case. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you can make on your own decision legally, mm -hmm. you can donate a kidney. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we face a lot of challenges in getting a donor in Kenya. Okay, we, you know, the good thing is we have a very close family needs, but you have to be the first thing you have to be is the same blood group. Yes. Okay, to, to to get a kidney donor. So you know, if, for example, if you have five people in the family, already you have sieved out three. Then you have two. You have to make sure they don't have high blood pressure. They don't have diabetes. They're not going to get diabetes in the future. So there's a third, and they have two kidneys. Some people are born with one. Yeah, yeah? these are fact. Yeah. yeah. So you you know, we have to make sure that we don't need two patients. We don't want the donor to become a patient as well. Mm -hmm. So we have to extensively work up. So you know, sometimes you can even get a kidney. I've transplanted. A patient within a month of dialysis you know start dialysis within a month because you know you work up very fast you already have a donor mm -hmm. you can get a kidney within a month mm -hmm. okay now you've touched on a few pointers as to what it entails a suitable donor apart from the age factor uh, how about um, you know can a stranger walk in and say okay fine I can give you a kidney is that something that you or is it the last resort so that's not allowed <clears throat> at all at all I get a lot of people coming into my clinic oh I want to sell my kidney that's that's you know legally not allowed okay you're not allowed to sell your kidney one two because there's a huge you know uh, ethical uh, principle behind it um, and then the second one is you know somebody can't just walk in uh, and say oh I want to donate a kidney to Sheila and and we go ahead and do it no there's a whole process you know, there's a whole ethical, legal, the lawyers are involved, you know, the ethics board is involved, the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why what we say, we only do living mm -hmm. related, okay? And the farthest we can go is emotionally related, not just somebody from the street. Uh, you, pick, you can pick up somebody, tell him, oh, I'll, I'm going to give you two million, come, I, you give me the kidney, we can't do that. Okay, why? Because, I mean, we bring to you stories like we just ran of Patrick, and people that know him from, you know, a while back what he does for the country he's been honored and now he needs this and I have a good working kidney and I want to give it to him so why stop that so uh, you know in Canada we used to have what we call altruistic donors yes okay uh, but how do you know altruism that's a big question right mm -hmm. uh, you, and unfortunately we live in, in in this part of the world where probably money is exchanged I, I can't say hundred times hundred percent of the time yes uh, but how much money is enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so some countries do that. Some mm -hmm. countries, the government takes an initiative mm -hmm. and says, if you want to become a donor, I'm going to give you, let's say, $10,000, okay? And you're going to give somebody a kidney because then they get off the dialysis mm -hmm. and that's a, a, you know, a resource for the country, mm -hmm. which is now not being consumed and somebody else can do that. Yeah. So if the government comes into play, the, the, the middleman kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, then you know those countries are doing that, mm -hmm. but not here. Not yet? No, not here, and I don't think it's going to happen in Kenya. Oh, wow. All right, that doesn't sound very encouraging, but hey, <laughs> let's work with what we have. Now, Shile, before your husband could give you the kidney, I'm sure he went through a very rigorous process. Explain, what were they looking for? Okay, we had to take all the tests, mm -hmm. uh, they had to check uh, he didn't suffer from anything, any disease. So we went for those checkups and uh, 
once they took all the checkups and it was taken to South Africa for, for the, to, the, to, to the doctors there to check uh, that they, we match mm -hmm. and then brought back. I think that was, that wasn't so much. Yeah. yeah, I mean nine months, that was yeah. pretty fast. Eh? Much, and yeah. considering this is your husband, not a blood-related yes. uh, relative, for you it was easier. Maybe the blood relation made it easier, but it still took a year. Why? Yeah, so the year was basically everything before the test. So you have to go through the social aspect of it, you know, just finding that donor, talking them through it, what is a kidney transplant, what does it mean for you and your life forward. So mm -hmm. that year and a half was talking mostly about that and getting there to that point of acceptance that this mm -hmm. is actually going to happen. Mm -hmm. But once we got to the hospital, they had to do, of course, the blood tests, they had to do kidney function tests, and then they did HLA matching where they check your, your immunity, like mm -hmm. how you match. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that was surprising for us was that we didn't match, I didn't match with my sister, even though we have the same parents. So they had to test my, my mom to make sure that we are actually siblings. Okay. And so it, a lot of people think that siblings, you have the same immunity, but we didn't. We picked a different uh, I guess different immunity from my dad and my mom yeah and so that that does happen and those kind of things are what make it take a while mm -hmm. you see but a year and a half is a short time because I know people have yeah. taken three years five years mm -hmm. it's it's can take a really long time depending on how your process goes everyone's process is different mm -hmm. because the recipient has to be healthy as well because mm -hmm. I remember my tests were really intense they, they checked my heart multiple times mm -hmm. because kidney patients actually suffer from heart disease as well yeah. because our fluids you know that they're, they're up sometimes when you drink a lot and the dialysis machine doesn't take out enough so that causes additional tests that have to be done mm -hmm. so there's as, the aspect of the, the, the recipient and then also the donor mm -hmm. so that's why it took it took a while for for me to get my transplant but a year and a half is is not long by the way compared to others yes okay dr ahmed they are both ready recipient and donor what how do you prep them let's talk about now prepping this uh, donor to be in a position to give and for them to be left in a good place to be as a healthy person. What do you do? Like a few days, two or a few weeks, how do you prep the donor? Okay, very good question. <clears throat> Let me interge interject what Job said first. So the faster you do the kidney transplant, the better for you. you people have seen, you know, studies have shown mm -hmm. that you, kidney transplants can prolong your life. Okay, rather to be on dialysis. Mm -hmm. And the faster you get a kidney transplant when you're on dialysis, the longer you can live. So that's, that's there. Okay. So people who, who need a kidney transplant, I would encourage them to have it earlier than, than wait for, for long. Mm -hmm. So preparing the, the, so you have to prepare both the donor and the recipient. Yes. First of all, you know, the donor has to be psychologically prepared to donate the kidney. Yeah. So the donor goes through counseling sessions um, and after the counseling sessions, once the, everything is agreed, then we start doing some tests. There are different stages of tests as we go. So as I said earlier, first we have to make sure you have two kidneys, both the kidneys are working very well, mm -hmm. and you don't have you know, predisposition to things like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and you're, having, you're maintaining a general healthy diet. You're not an excessive smoker, you're not an alcoholic, you know, you don't have previous, you know, histories of surgeries, previous history of infections, you know, like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, because you don't want that to go to, uh, mm -hmm. to the receipt, donor who doesn't yeah. have them. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, that's a different story because now HIV patients can do donate kidneys to HIV patients. Uh -huh. Hepatitis C don patients can donate patients to hepatitis C, so that's okay. a different story. So once all this is done and, you know, and then we have the ethics board uh, meeting the patients as well, making sure everything's okay. As for the recipients, you know, we have to dialyze them three times a week, make sure they're healthy, they're strong mm -hmm. uh, before they go into the, into the transplant. Mm -hmm. Then we have a board meeting with all the doctors. It's not only one doctor who does a transplant. Yes. There's the nephrologist, the, the transplant surgeon, the vascular mm -hmm. surgeon, the urologist, and the anesthetist. We mm -hmm. all sit together with the family members, have a discussion, mm -hmm. see if anything is missed out. Mm -hmm. And thereafter, we get a transplant date. And so the transplant takes around two, two and a half hours, okay? So both of them enter the theater together. So at one side, you're removing the kidney from the donor, mm -hmm. uh, and the other side, we are actually ready to get that kidney so that we reduce those times I was talking about, the warm and the cold ischemia time. Mm -hmm. And once the transplant is done, the recipient, the one who's got the kidney, mm -hmm. the new kidney, goes you know, to a semi-ICU area, 
and the donor goes to the ward. The donor usually stays in the hospital for three days, then goes back home, oh. you know, just on some few painkillers, mm -hmm. can go back to normal, usual work after three weeks. Okay. The recipient, the one who gets the kidney, stays in the hospital for a week and is discharged after a week once everything is okay. For observation. Yes. Okay, let's talk about a, a, another reason why it probably takes a bit longer for other people to get uh, a donor. The stigma around it. So you're asking for my kidney and people would say, what if I give you my kidney and I die? So you and your husband probably already agreed this is the best thing to do. Did you ever find or have to deal with family members coming in and saying, is this really a good idea? Yeah, actually we went through that. Uh, after my husband agreed, the family was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, it was it wasn't easy for him. Yeah. But he had he said I've decided I'm going to give her. Mm. No one is going to come around and stop me from doing that. What were their reasons? Um, okay, they were saying uh, maybe he'll he'll not survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'll give you and then passes out. What what will happen? What happens yeah. after that? Mm. Okay, for you, Job, your sister. Yes. Did you get any? Uh, I don't naysayers, so to speak. Of course, <coughs> there yeah. are many naysayers. Uh -huh. uh, the stigma is real. Because she was young and not married, a lot of people are wondering who will marry her, what will happen after the transplant, <coughs> will she be able to get a baby? So there are a lot of myths and misconceptions out there. And this is why I'm so happy that you're having this platform and we're talking about this because yeah. as patients mm -hmm. we need to stand up and talk about it and say hey I've had a transplant and I'm healthy I'm here and I'm you know I can contribute to my society mm. because the people out there the naysayers they will talk and say all these things that are not true they mm. don't have the, the facts behind them and so going to see a doctor and even talking about it is very helpful and it also helps if the donors come out and say hey, I'm still here and I'm living with one kidney, right? So you can see, they, they look healthier than me, yeah. right? So, <laughs> yes. And they've got a kidney transplant, yeah. right? So, so that's what people should understand. Mm. And, and because of that, what we have, you know, once a year is what we call transplant games, mm -hmm. okay? And we have it this March, of March 16th, mm -hmm. where the donors and the recipients come together yeah. and play sports together and you see them probably sometimes you know the recipients might be even better than the donors okay. or that they were out. so you know people are out there looking at them mm -hmm. you know living a normal life mm -hmm. so as job said you know these platforms yeah. like this really help the population all right before we went to break we were talking about how it is interesting people look at it from different points of view in as far as uh, recipients and donors kidney donors are concerned and some would be naysayers others are thumbs up about it but the truth of the matter is doctor there are those who believe that it is their you know prerogative whether or not they give their kidney and uh, let me read a tweet here is a Peterson who says, if I visit a Kinyozi, they shave my hair and nobody quizzes me. Therefore, doctor, since I own the kidney legally from God, I can sell it as willing seller to a willing buyer. Your comment. <laughs> it's not as easy as that. Yeah. It's, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. You know, a kidney is an organ. Something can go wrong, right? You can die when donating a kidney. It's possible then, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a Kinyozi... You just you shave your head off and nothing's major gonna going to happen. Mm -hmm. What in the future if the kidney which is which is left in fails, right? Mm -hmm. Then what? You know, you'll come back to the uh, to the to the recipient and tell him to give you back the kidney and give the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lot. There's the, the whole world uh, has come around it, and um, so what we call there's an Istanbul Disc declaration. Okay, where you know people from all around the world came and sat and decided what is good for the kidney transplant, what is bad. Because in the in the past there was a lot of you know as you say black market, you know people go out get kidneys from somewhere, you know get them fixed and come back, mm -hmm. and that's now totally clamped down. There's nothing like that happening anymore. If it is, then very 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 few mm -hmm. uh, places. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know again a lot of ethical issues. How much is enough? What if something bad happens to you? Uh, why should I take your kidney and not the other one who is selling? Uh, so there are many, many, many other things which mm. are involved. It's not as easy as that. All right, let's touch on altruism. Dr. Ria Ali has said he doesn't see that happening in Kenya, but you believe that this is possible, and that's why you even founded the Education Centre, right? Yes, um, being on dialysis, you spend so much time. It's four hours 
per session and you do it three or two times a week, okay? Yeah. So that's a lot of time. And I would sit there just wondering if I had a kidney and, and, and dreaming about it. Mm -hmm. So for me, getting a kidney was a second chance, just automatically, you know it's a second chance for me. So I wonder when people say that they want to sell or, or even, you know, that, that thought shouldn't come in your mind. Because when you donating, it should be altruistic. It should be something that you're, you're willing to, to give. Mm -hmm. But I believe that with education, with people like us, me and, and uh, my friend here, Sheila. When, we, Sheila, yes, when we come out, we tell our stories because we've seen that part of that. This is where you're sitting for hours, mm -hmm. you're demotivated, you even get depressed. So I believe that when they hear our stories, the patients, the people who you're helping, the, the, the conversation will shift mm -hmm. because it's not about selling anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, people will understand this is a need. It's not something that we just sit there and you're like, okay, I need a kidney. No, mm -hmm. if you don't get this kidney, your life changes. You're on dialysis, you have no time. You, the things you could do, you might not be able to do because you don't have the energy, you don't have the, the time. So I believe, I'm a, I'm a believer, that we can shift this conversation. And, and the people who really understand what altruistic is, you're, you're, you're giving it, mm -hmm. you know, because you want to help. It's not about selling, it's not about money. It's not a business. It's not a business. Mm. This is you reaching out to someone else and saying, hey, mm -hmm. I have something that can help you. Not because mm -hmm. I'll get anything, but I'll see you get your life back. I'll mm -hmm. see you spend time with your family. I'll see you, you know, do things that anyone can do, you know, who is healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, Sheila, after the transplant, are there things about your life that you needed to shift around to ensure that uh, the kidney stayed healthy and in you and you did not reject it? Yes. Uh, okay. After, after the kidney transplant, I had to really check on my dad what I've been given from the hospital, what I'm supposed to do. I really, have to f I really had to change my lifestyle also. Mm -hmm. I used to hang out a lot when I, I didn't have these problems, but yeah. <laughs> after my kidney, the kidney transplant, my life just changed. So when you say hang out a lot, <coughs> we're talking about alcohol. Oh, alcohol, uh -huh. yeah, going out, you know, mm -hmm. staying for long. You know, when you're out there, you don't take your, you don't, you need, you not take care of your medication and mm -hmm. these other things. So mm -hmm. I had to keep that aside mm -hmm. and check on my health, mm -hmm. what I've been told by the, the doctor, what to do. I really had to follow it. How yeah. about diet? Yeah, even my diet had to change. Mm -hmm. I had to change my diet. Although, not so much. Yeah. Not so much, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, for you, Joab? So when you're on dialysis, you can't eat a lot of things. Uh, potassium is one of the biggest things that uh, dialysis patients have to control. So if you know vegetables <coughs> are a lot of potassium, fruits have a lot of potassium. So you're limited to certain kinds of fruits, like apples or, you know, you can leach the vegetables, which means that you soak them or boil them and you pour the water out because uh, potassium is soluble in water. So that life on dialysis is very restricting. But once you get a transplant, now you can eat your potatoes, you can go back to life almost like normal. Mm -hmm. But then there's some things we can't eat, like grapefruit that interferes with the medication. So those, compared to what we had on dialysis, mm -hmm. it's 100 times better, you see. So my diet did change, because also you're predisposed to diabetes on the medication we are yeah. on. Mm -hmm. So you have to watch out for that. But then, if you're comparing it to what I had on dialysis, mm -hmm. you know, dialysis, you could eat rice, we, you see, we eat a lot of rice, mm -hmm. you know, and meat is very limited too. So the, the diet is very restricting on dialysis. So a transplant does give you that flexibility, mm -hmm. but you have to watch out for some things. But overall, a transplant is so much better. Okay, Dr. Ahmed, you'll speak on the risk factors for both the donor and the recipient. After we come back from Moranga County, I am told that uh, Mati Moore is now ready for us, uh, still with the CEC for Moranga County. Uh, thank you so much, Gladys and us. We sincerely apologize for the, for the technical hitch earlier. Now, as I, bef before the, the hitch, I was talking to uh, the, the minister in charge of health. I just uh, let us carry on with our conversation. Uh, you, you told me that uh, there was people used to go to Kenyatta, yes. uh, and that's how I decided to put up this uh, this facility. Yes. Uh, carry on. Um, thank you uh, once again. Uh, in the year 2015, mm -hmm. July, we opened this renal you know, unit, and as I, as I had said earlier, it was because uh, we had a lot of patients who were referring to Kenyatta. As you know, Muranga County Referral Hospital 
that time did not have this unit. So every patient who used to come here with renal problem, we used to refer them to Kenyatta. But nowadays, we don't refer because we have these facilities here. We also have uh, trained a doctor, a nephrologist, who is taking care of this. When we started this renal unit, we took 11 um, staff, health workers, for training at Kenyatta Hospital so that they are able to run it. So it's run professionally. We started with four dialysis machines. And the president, the MES program, added us another. Then we were given another one by uh, the family of the late Christine Wamboy, who we have named the unit. So right now we have 10 machines and we do patients every day. And since we started in 2015, we've been able to do 16,200 sessions. And um, if you look at the cost of one session, which is about 9,500, if you multiply 9,500 with 16,200, you realize that these patients here, um, the cost will come to about 150 million. And for here, we started giving free services. Then we enrolled everyone who was um, in, the, in, the, in the unit through NHIF. Mm -hmm. So they come, they are dialyzed, and then NHIF takes care of their expenses. Mm -hmm. So they are able to go there smoothly. Mm -hmm. And we have had patients. Martin Moore is still with the CC for Muranga County. We seem to be having an issue this morning, but then again, it's good news. At least we know that the renal unit there is changing lives and doing a lot for kidney patients. Now back to you, Dr. Tari. What are the risk factors for a donor and a recipient after a transplant? So, you know, uh, the risk factors is, starts with before the transplant, during the transplant, and then after. So. Let's, let's start with the donor. Mm. You know, you can live a normal life with one kidney. Uh, that's why you can give, because you have, you have two, you can give one. Mm. But you have to be careful, okay? You have to lead a healthy life after that. If you say, oh no, let me just eat everything, drink everything, don't exercise, then you'll probably, you know, get things like high blood pressure, diabetes in the future. Mm -hmm. So you have to lead a healthy life after donating a kidney. The, and we usually do tests before, just to make sure that you know you can leave. Uh, some people are born with one kidney, mm -hmm. so the the main uh, risk is you know for the surgery when you get anesthesia. So mm -hmm. anesthesia is a risk, okay, mm -hmm. uh, very minor minor risk. But again, you're willing to donate the kidney, you're willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. The surgery itself, you know, it's 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 an incision, yeah. uh, and you know we remove the kidney. So sometimes, like very 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 rarely, you can cut something else which is not which should, shouldn't be cut. But again, it can be repaired, it can be stitched. Uh, so the surgery itself is a, is, is a risk you go through. It's just like any other surgery you go through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thereafter, as I said, uh, there's no major risks if you stay a healthy life, a healthy uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. For the recipient, uh, you know, the surgery again is a risk because it's a, it's a surgery, anesthesia and surgery. And thereafter, you have to take your medications regularly you know, the medications which will suppress your immunity uh, to, so that the new kidney, your body doesn't reject the new kidney. So the body doesn't fight the new kidney because it's something foreign to eat. Mm -hmm. So as we have seen, you know, our patients here, they took, brought their medicines here and took yeah, them yeah. at the, a specific time they're supposed to take, mm -hmm. you know, twice a day. And that reduces your immunity. Again, by reducing your immunity, you get a risk of, you know, possible infections. Yeah, okay. So you have to be very careful. Again, leading a healthy, lifestyle as we've heard from uh, from our our patients here you know avoid a lot of uh, sugary starchy foods uh, you know eat eat in uh, eat well exercise so you don't get you know things like diabetes mm -hmm. which is one of the risk fa you know side effects of a the medications the medications okay. they get uh -huh. you know, the medications they get to reduce the immunity the steroids the tacrolimus can cause diabetes mm -hmm. so uh, if you lead a healthy life then you won't get that Okay. So those are the some of the few risks which okay. they would go through. Okay, our phone lines are open. Felix from Nanyuki now joins us. What's your question or comment? Okay, my question is uh, I have a patient who has been undergoing dialysis for now some time. But recently she developed some problems like uh, she's vomiting, uh, chest problems like breathing, she's very weak, and uh, also again, in uh, her heart and lungs, there's uh, some fluid inside. 
So I was asking uh, Dr. Hamid, what could be the problem? Okay, I think before he answers some few facts, how long has she been undergoing dialysis? She's been undergoing dialysis for the last two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. Okay, how old is she? Okay, she's uh, 23 years old. All right. That, uh, yeah. Any more questions to him before you yeah, answer? Sure. It's, it's, a very, it's a good question you're asking. And, you know, so what happens, let's go back to functions of the kidney. Okay, the one of the functions of the kidney is get rid of the water from the body. When you drink, you don't think about anything. You just drink like three, four glasses of water. You pee it out. But people who have kidney problems, they can't pee that water out. So if you keep drinking, you know, you start accumulating water in your body. So water gets accumulated in the lungs, around the heart, in the legs. That's why you see swelling. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, patients who are on dialysis, have restricted amount of water intake because, you know, the kidney is not working unless you go for dialysis. So that's why earlier you heard that, you know, the gentleman loses three kilos when he goes for dialysis. Mm -hmm. It's because they remove the excess water. Uh -huh. That's why the weight goes down. Okay. Okay. So, you know, the way to remove this water is probably frequent dialysis and reduce the amount of, you know, water intake. Uh, uh, so if you do frequent dialysis, for example, three times a week, you can now remove three liters, three liters, three liters. If not, if you do only two times a week, that means you have seven days. And so that's if, even if you drink a liter, that's seven liters mm -hmm. to, be, to be removed twice a week in four hours. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult. The maximum we can remove because we do dialysis for four hours is four liters a session. You cannot remove more than that okay. usually. Uh -huh. and, and, and the other thing is, you know, this is a young lady. Probably this could be not chronic kidney disease, but acute kidney injury. Mm -hmm. So the kidneys might start working. So she needs to see a doctor, mm -hmm. okay, a, a nephrologist in particular, mm -hmm. and see what's causing her kidney problem. The other thing what could be possible is, you know, what we need for dialysis is a vascular access mm -hmm. means you know you take blood clean it up and put it back so they usually get catheters like the way you have lines in the yeah, hand yeah. you will get one bigger one around the neck mm -hmm. so that can get infected very easily so the other thing is maybe that catheter is infected and she should see a nephrologist okay now while still on the subject uh, a normal human being is told take your eight glasses of water a day how many glasses are you restricted to as a kidney patient <clears throat> so again, uh, so what we recommend our patients not to drink more than 500 to a liter of fluid in a day, 500 cc, oh. 500 mils. Okay. So like two glasses. Uh huh. Okay. All right. I hope that goes to help your sister and also see a nephrologist as the doctor is saying to understand better what's going on with her. Now, Sheila, your husband as a donor also needed to adjust his lifestyle, did he? Yes, he did. How? Okay, he stopped also drinking, although it's not so, <laughs> so, so easy, but he's yeah. really trying, he's really trying, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, others for him, I don't think there's, okay, for, medic for medication he stopped earlier. Yeah. And uh, the further foods he's also drinking, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's also taking the food. Did he yeah. take up exercising? Because I hear it's Exercise, yes, even exercise, because he do a lot of farming, he does a lot of farming. Mm. So with that farming work, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, Job was just having a conversation earlier and you said after a transplant, some things inevitably change about your life. For example, you had a corporate job that you had to walk away from out of choice and also at times just because of the fact that you now are living a different life after the transplant. Explain that. So before my transplant, of course, I was, I was working. I'm an engineer. Mm -hmm. and. It's just life as normal and when kidney disease hit it was so sudden for me and so when I went through that it was it was like my life stopped and when my sister stood up to say that she wants to be a donor it touched my heart so much that I, I felt like I have to change my life path if that makes sense <coughs> I, I felt that I, I have to help more people because when someone stops their life because in 2016 that whole year my sister didn't do anything she came followed me I was in the States at the time so she took off work, she would come and visit me for months on end. And seeing that love, that unconditional love in person, it changes you. Mm -hmm. Because here I, I, I am on dialysis, mm -hmm. I'm thinking this might be the rest of my life, you know, I have to go for four hours, I'm tired all the time, I can't eat what I want. And then someone says, you know what, I feel you, I'm going to help you, we can walk th through this together. Mm -hmm. And so when she did that, 
it, it made me rethink my life, and, mm -hmm. and that's the truth. So I, I, when I came back and I saw how transplant recipients, we go back to life as normal, which is what the doctor recommends, yes. but it, it impacts you so much that I feel like we need to give back because we've been given the second chance. Yeah. We have more energy. So I decided to found my organization called Transplant Education Kenya. Okay. And our goal is to make transplantation more accessible because a lot of people end up staying on dialysis, especially young people. We're the ones who will mm -hmm. food that bill, will stay on dialysis long because we're young. You know, older people, they'll go on dialysis and maybe not last as long. But a young person is going to hold it on like we're gonna mm -hmm. stay on dialysis longer so most dialysis patients are actually young below, people yes 40s below 40 okay let yeah. me hold that thought we okay. need to pick a line Steven from Mombasa is calling what's your question or comment no no when you hello network yes yeah. I'm, I'm Steven yes yeah Okay, there seems to be a cross in the network. Can you hear us, Stephen? Stephen? Okay, when he's ready, we'll cross over to him. So, Job, you were saying most people on dialysis are 40 and below. Yes, mm -hmm. they, they tend to be younger, the ones who stay on dialysis long term. Mm -hmm. uh, because once you find out you have kidney failure, you have two choices. You have dialysis and a transplant. So if you cannot afford a transplant and NHF is paying for dialysis, a lot of people opt to stay on dialysis, not opt, they're, they're, they're forced to stay on dialysis mm. because the government pays for that. But a transplant, they'll pay for the surgery, which is well and good, and we, we, we're grateful for NHF for that. But the medication, as Dr. Sokwala said, the immunos are very expensive. You're, mm. you're spending 30 to above 30000 a month on these medications, and you have to have them every day. I carried mine at 10, I'll take, I take them every day. Yeah. So that is a big challenge that mm -hmm. we see a lot of young people staying on dialysis because of that. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, I know I can, the, the, the surgery is not a big deal. We can do a harambe, get that money, do it. But then after, people will now start mm -hmm. thinking that, ah, you got your transplant. So why are you not working? What's, what's going on? You know, so they, they kind of back off after that. Mm -hmm. And you're left alone to deal with your, your, your immunos, with your labs, going to see the doctor. Mm -hmm. That's all footed by the, the, the recipient. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Can you qualify that and also sure. probably chime in on the fact that there are, few, there are young, more younger people stuck on dialysis, so to speak? Right. So let me uh, touch on the immunosuppressants, mm -hmm. like the medications you have to take after transplant. If those are life-saving drugs, if you don't take those medications, you get a rejection. If you get a rejection, your kidney is shut down, you have to go back on dialysis. So the patients know how important those medications are. They would not rather not eat food, mm -hmm. but get those medications. So a little stress here is, you know, if NHIF is paying for dialysis, we say around 80,000 a month, mm -hmm. why can't they pay for transplant drugs? Because these patients who were on dialysis before now have got a kidney transplant. So, you know, pay, pay them the, 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 the medication mm -hmm. for, for the transplant so that you don't, they don't go back into dialysis. Because yeah. if they go back, then you'll have to pay their dialysis. And that's a cost to the government. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, that makes logical sense. Yeah. So I think this should be carried forward. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second question was, sorry. Uh, younger and younger people yes. on dialysis. So, so, the, so in this part of the world, you know, the main cause of kidney disease is what we call uh, inflammation in the kidney. One of the main causes that is glomerulonephritis. That's probably what Job had as well. You know, uh, you get an infection or your body starts fighting the kidney. Okay, you start losing protein and protein and blood from the urine, mm -hmm. and it's not picked up early. Okay, it's not picked up early and treated appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, so if if out there, if you see that there is, you know, your urine is very frothy, your leg is swelling you know, you have blood in the urine, go see your doctor as soon as possible. Because mm -hmm. that might be a, a window where you can be treated and your kidney doesn't fail. Mm -hmm. I have like huge amounts of patients like this, mm -hmm. okay? So what happens is, you know, they're just treated like a urinary tract infection and they end up, you know, that inflammation causes the kidney to, to die off. That's why we have a lot of young patients who are on dialysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm informed that we have Lawrence from Meru with a question or comment. Lawrence? Yes. What is your question or comment? Uh, uh, I'm 28 year, years old. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with uh, 
Leuro infection. I then went under medication for, I was diagnosed with Leuro infection. Mm. And then I went under medication for six months. Then uh, at the end of uh, when I was almost to complete the medication, I was diagnosed with uh, nephrotic syndrome. And I was detained for about uh, three months in a uh, local chemist. Then uh, I descended, I, when I saw that uh, I was improving, I descended to seek medication uh, to the general hospital in Meru. Then uh, there was no any doctor to treat me who, who was aware about nephrotic syndrome. So I decided to, to travel to Kenyatta. Then uh, when I came to Kenyatta, I saw that the line was so big such that I, I didn't uh, get any doctor. Then now I decided to come to my room, but uh, my health is still, it's not deteriorating, but I'm fearing that uh, it may worsen as I continue. So I was think I was asking where can I get that doctor? The nephrologist or a doctor who can cater for your needs? Yes, okay. a nephrologist. Okay. All right, yeah. thank you for calling. Yes. Okay, now Dr. liver infection then was diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome, one of the causes of uh, kidney failure. What are you seeing here? So as I just before this I, that's what I said, you know, yes. you see frothy urine okay that's protein leaking in the urine mm -hmm. okay and then you see your leg swelling this is what we call nephrotic syndrome so a kidney is like a sieve okay uh, so it it doesn't allow protein to leak from our body so when that sieve gets destroyed you start leaking protein just like you know the way you pour your tea with the sieve then you start leaking that protein in the urine mm -hmm. and that damages the kidney Okay, and that's probably what's happening with with Lawrence. Mm -hmm. So we, what he needs ideally is a kidney biopsy. Mm -hmm. Okay, take a small sample of the kidney, look it under a microscope, see what's causing his nephrotic syndrome. Mm -hmm. There are many diseases which can cause you know this loss of of of, of the filter, mm -hmm. and treat it accordingly. Before, if it's left untreated, then he might end up having being on dialysis and then kidney transplant in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was alluding to earlier. Yeah. Okay, and then. You know, what I would suggest is avoid over-the-counter medications, mm -hmm. okay? Things like painkillers. Some painkillers can cause damage to the kidney, Yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, over-the-counter drugs, which you don't really know, are they helping the kidney? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, suggest he just goes to the pharmacy and gets medication. Mm -hmm. He should see a proper kidney doctor, a nephrologist. Mm -hmm. uh, and his question was, where does he get one in mm -hmm. Meru? How can we help him? Uh, Mm, you know, I, I work at Aga Khan University mm -hmm. Hospital and we train physicians there. Mm -hmm. Some of my students are there in Meru. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Guilford, he should go and see Dr. Guilford if, if he... Where is he situated? Um, there's Dr. Guilford and uh, uh, Dr. Hilda. I think Dr. Hilda is in Tanwek. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Guilford is in Meru town. I, 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 but, you know... Mm -hmm. We can give him the numbers later on. Okay, so what would suggest, Lawrence, get in touch with us so that we're able to share with you context of the nephrologists, as uh, Dr. Terry has mentioned, and you will get uh, the care that you deserve. Well, we continue taking in your comments and your questions, and of course, as you engage us on this conversation, kidney transplantation, we now cross over to Homer Bay County, where my colleague Bernard Ote, or rather Ojoang, is standing by with a doctor to speak on the same. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Gladys. Uh, we are here in Homabi town. I remember, uh, just to take you back in 2017, uh, Kenya Renal Association Chairman uh, Seth Ligeo said that uh, about uh, 4.4 uh, 4 million uh, Kenyans are suffering from this chronic disease, uh, kidney disease, and only 10% uh, can afford uh, the dialysis. And of course, uh, we are here with Dr. Kevin Osuri, the, uh, the one in charge of uh, all doctors in, Nyan in Nyanza region. He is a doctor at uh, Oma Bay County Teaching and Referral Ref uh, Hospital, and he will be telling us the status, the challenges, and also whether they have also they are also doing trans transplant and uh, cost of dialysis. To say, Doctor, uh, could you just please tell us the statistic here in Homer Bay County? 
Well, thank you so much, uh, NTV. Um, we do uh, renal di diseases or kidney diseases are considered one of the neglected diseases because it's it's one of the non-communicable diseases, just like hypertension and diabetes. But it is silent in the sense that it is not often diagnosed until very late, especially in our region here in Homabe and in Nyanza. Uh, but uh, as a county, I think we have made tremendous strides in the sense that uh, Homabe County currently is able to offer dialysis services. And we do have so many renal clients, both who uh, have been diagnosed and those who have not been diagnosed. Uh, currently, the referral hospital diagnose, uh, I mean, dial, dialyzes 23 patients. And remember, each patient requires about two sessions in a week. So we do about 46 sessions in a week or more. Uh, we do have dialysis machines that were placed in the referral hospital. Remember the MESS program, the Medical uh, Equipment Services program that was uh, launched by the national government. That has been of tremendous help to us. So we are able to locally uh, dialyze our patients who would have otherwise previously before been referred to either Kenyatta or Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital. However, we have not been able or we don't have the capacity in Homa Bay to do renal transplants. So if a patient is able to do transplant, we have so far referred two patients from Homa Bay who have successfully had renal transplants, and we are following them up now once the operation was done in Kenyatta National Hospital. We are able to follow them up from our hospital. Uh, doctor, many, many patients are shying off because, uh, because of the cost. Yes. Uh, could you just please set up the cost? Uh, fortunately, National Hospital uh, Insurance Fund, NHIF, uh, covers for all our 23 patients. So roughly uh, NHF reimburses about 9,500 shillings per session. That is about uh, 19,000 shillings per week per patient. It is quite prohibitive, as you can tell. And remember, you're going to be dialyzed for a long time. Uh, so we do have some patients who, of course, are not in NHIF coverage, but they have renal uh, disease and they require dialysis. So for those ones, they pay cash for the first uh, sessions. And immediately we have a program to enroll them into NHIF. The cost is very prohibitive. That is why previously you'd find many people not uh, being able to afford and they would die because of renal disease. Okay, just tell me, oh, in Homa Bay, the statistics, is it alarming? And uh, could you just please tell us something about the children? Are, uh, do you usually receive children cases? The cases in children are not as much as they are in adults. Remember, renal disease sometimes is a complication of diseases like diabetes or hypertension. So uncontrolled hypertension or uncon un un uncontrolled uh, diabetes may also lead to renal disease. So the cases are so many. However, I have to note that uh, not many patients do come to the hospital for this diagnosis. That is why we find them late. But we have so many patients on, uh, on treatment for hypertension and for diabetes. Unfortunately, many of them stop in the middle. Uh, saying, you know, I feel better now, I don't want to take my drugs anymore. And for that reason, or other reasons, like they resort to tra uh, herbs and traditional medications, then they fall into kidney failure or renal uh, uh, failure. And then, therefore, now we have to dialyze them. So, doctor, uh, doctor, you are talking about many people, they come later. What do you, what do you think makes them, may make them shy from at least seeking for your support as a medical practitioner? Well, uh, we unfortunately in this region we do have poor health seeking behaviors where somebody, one or a client goes to hospital to seek medication or to seek uh, medical advice only after they are severely ill. But there are symptoms that people should be able to uh, know out there and watch out for. Like, for example, if you have puffiness, facial puffiness. You wake up in the morning and your face is swollen or your feet are swollen, then you need to come to hospital and you need to check you and rat, do several tests and know is it kidney disease, is it heart disease. We also have issues where people, uh, I mean, you have either low urine output or you do not urinate at all, such kind of challenges, and also drug interactions, which also may lead to kidney failure. But the main focus here is that uh, there are people out there 
who have kidney disease and they don't know. What are the challenges maybe you are you facing as doctors? Well, as doctors, uh, one of the challenges we face is that we, you know, the the number of medics is low. So we have staffing challenges. Even at the hospital, we would wish to do more dialysis, but we are unable to because dialysis is not just any ordinary thing. You have to be specially trained to be able to dialyze a patient so that you don't complicate their lives further. And as well, the other challenges that we face is sometimes erratic supplies of uh, the things that we use to dialyze patients, things like blood lines, bicarbonates. So you may find there could be a shortage maybe for a day or two, which complicates the whole scenario. Remember someone, if he goes for a day longer with toxins in his body, it's dangerous to him. So those are the challenges we face. So in Oma Bay, can we say it, the statistics is alarming? Yes, it is alarming. And it is not just alarming in Homa Bay alone. This is a countrywide problem. Uh, we would encourage people to come to hospital, come to us as professionals. We will, we will guide you. We will take, uh, I mean, take you through the steps properly and help you to arrest this in time. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've just heard uh, from uh, Dr. Kevin Osuri, uh, who the head of uh, doctors here in Homa Bay County, and also uh, Nyanza Kempidiu chairman is saying that in, Nyanza, in this region alone, the cases of chronic disease, uh, that is kidney disease, is alarming, and uh, most of the, the patients here are uh, they seek uh, the, the services, doctor services late, and uh, this is giving them a hard time at least to dialyze them, and also so uh, he's saying that uh, they need more doctors at least to be employed so as uh, to help curb uh, such cases back to you. Thank you, Bernard John, coming to us from Homer Bay and uh, a very insightful discussion there with the Daktari there. And uh, it points to some areas, I don't know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, probably having a higher prevalence than most. Is this something that you're seeing, a certain tendency? prevalence of kidney disease yeah, kidney diseases in a certain part of the of the country than others okay you know again uh, HIV can cause kidney disease so mm -hmm. prevalences of higher HIV disease in a certain part of country mm -hmm. would have higher prevalence of things like malaria other infections you know predispose you to having kidney disease mm -hmm. or now cities where you know people just sit go to the offices people who have you know change of lifestyle diabetes, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. then those are the areas where you can get higher, higher uh, uh, incidences of kidney disease. Mm -hmm. One of the things the doctor mentioned which was very important is, you know, dialysis cannot be done by anyone. Uh, you know, as, as we see that young girl we heard earlier, yeah. she's suffering mm -hmm. because probably, you know, uh, in, inadequate personnel, you don't have nephrologists in that area mm -hmm. who can adequately assess these patients. Mm -hmm. So opening up the dialysis units all over the country is good, but you have to have, you know, specialized personnel to take care of these patients. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they will, you know, you're causing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm informed Stephen from Mombasa is back on the line with us. Stephen, if you can hear me, what's your question or comment? Uh, good morning to you. Good morning. Donate Go ahead, Stephen. Yes, currently there are younger people donating their kidneys. Uh, for example, I have a cousin of mine who donated his kidney at the age of 22 mm -hmm. to his older brother. And my question is this: in the in the later years, maybe they could develop hypertension or type 2 diabetes. Uh, most of the time, we know that hypertension, essential hypertension, is not majorly due to lifestyle, it could be due to the genetics and, and other things that are uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. So does their lifespan, is their lifespan reduced or what, what happens in that situation when the donor is too young? Okay, very good question, Dr. I actually had that question for you. When you donate, does it reduce your lifespan? So it doesn't reduce your lifespan because you can live with one kidney, as I said, yes. a normal life. Mm -hmm. You know, one kidney is enough. Mm -hmm. But you have to take care of yourself, mm -hmm. right? If you just say, I'm going to donate my kidney and I'll eat all the salt in this world, all the fast foods, everything, I want to exercise, mm -hmm. then obviously you will be more prone to getting, mm -hmm. just like the normal population, you're prone to getting, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes. Mm -hmm. But if you have one kidney and you start developing high blood pressure, diabetes, then that one kidney takes a, a higher you know, told than if you have two kidneys. Okay.
As we wrap up our conversation this morning about kidney transplantation awareness, I'll start with you, Joel, but just reading up on your story, you said while you were going through your dialysis and reading up on this disease, you it revealed it was revealed to you that lack of periodic checkup is what led to your late diagnosis. And from hence that and then henceforth, you've been pushing for the same. Yes. So as you know, I was young when I was diagnosed and a lot of young people do not check like we're we feel invincible we feel like superman you know and that's one of the the biggest issues with kidney disease it's silent it goes under the radar you do not feel it and i i'm a testament i'm a testament to that you know that i didn't feel anything so for me those tests before you know going in a regular checkup or even for wild kidney they actually march is kidney month if people if you don't know it's kidney month and wild kidney day they test people, you know, they test you for uh, protein in your urine. Uh, they, I think they do some blood tests, if I'm not wrong, but mm -hmm. they will test just to see if you have diabetes or that. Mm -hmm. So I, I am very big on those tests before because when you find out and you're in stage two or three, you can slow down the progression mm -hmm. or you can even prevent going on dialysis rather than finding out and you're in stage five and you're already on dialysis and now you're looking for a transplant. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very key. Yes. Okay, all right. Now, for you, Sheila, you said the fact that you were not taking care of the diabetes that you'd lived with for the longest is probably what, you know, fed to the fact that you got kidney failure. Going forward, what's your clarion call? Okay, for that, okay, I can say that uh, it's good at least somebody to know earlier. If we can get that education early mm -hmm. on, on your health, it, it, but for, for me, I, I say it, it, could have helped, it could have helped me to know that this, uh, this disease can bring other causes mm -hmm. to my body. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say that uh, if people were taught earlier or they could see, see their doctors and get to know their, life, uh, their, their health, mm. it, it will really help a lot of people. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Ahmed, before you give us your last words, there's a question to you. How is it that there's some people who reject over and over and over again the organs that they're donated to? So it means that, you know, <clears throat> your body has already preformed what we call antibodies. Mm -hmm. Those are soldiers which will fight, you know, the foreign uh, organ you're getting. So when, when you reject one first kidney, you're already forming more soldiers, okay? So the second kidney has a higher chance of mm -hmm. getting rejected. And then you get a second kidney, you form more soldiers. Okay. So that's why you, you know, so uh, the first one should get it right. And that's how, you know, things, uh, things that's why we do all that matching and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so in closing, you say we are doing transplantation in Kenya and it's now triple with NHIF. Your last words? So uh, obviously, yes, we're doing kidney transplants in Kenya. You know, most of the big hospitals around that are doing kidney transplants. We do kidney transplants in Aga Khan where Sheila got her transplant. Mm -hmm. The cost is around 1.8 to 2 million. NHIF pays around 500,000 of those co of that cost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's more affordable to do it locally with mm -hmm. your family around. That, that's that's one of my closing. The other mm -hmm. closing remark is, as Job said, mm -hmm. screening. Yeah. You know, we have World Kidney Day on the 14th of March at Uhuru Park. So, you know, get yourself tested. You know, if you have any symptoms of kidney disease, don't wait till it's too late. Mm -hmm. Get it checked early and get it treated early. Mm -hmm. And if you have things like high blood pressure, diabetes, mm -hmm. get them well controlled mm -hmm. so that you don't develop kidney disease. Okay, all right. That has been Dr. Ahmed Sokwala, nephrologist, kidney doctor, Sheila Kitsura, kidney transplant patient, Joa Boa, co-founder Transplant Education Center, and he's also a kidney transplant patient, even as we got more awareness around kidney transplants in Kenya and, that, and how that looks like for kidney patients. Well, that conversation still continues on Twitter at Gladys underscore Gashanja at NTV Kenya. Your questions, we shall be referred to either the doctor or Joab himself and even Sheila, even as you get more information on the same. Thank you for your time on NTV today. My name is Gladys Gashanja.